magnet that's very difficult to clip it, but make it easy enough to clip so that I can clip it with reasonable electronics. That, of course, is a design problem for magnetic fields. Soft magnets. An even bigger problem in the real world is how to make a magnet soft. Because most uh, electronic generation, transmission, and so on, generators, transformers, motors, rewrite tails, electromagnetic shielding, is based on your ability to flip magnetic fields. And it takes energy to do that. Now, you have a transformer out here. You go by, you, you, you pass a transformer on a telephone pole. If you listen carefully, you can hear humming. What that humming is, is you're seeing an alternating field. The alternating field flips the magnetic field. It's iron. When you flip the magnetic field because of magnetic friction, I'll tell you about in just a minute, you change where the carbon atoms want to be in the um, voids in the iron. So the carbon atoms are moving back and forth every time you flip that field, and that's what makes it on. Well, all of this costs energy. So you're paying for energy to create that vibrating field. The lower, the narrower the hysteresis loop, the less energy you're wasting in flipping the magnetic field. And as a consequence, um, there is a huge, uh, in fact, if, if you just look at the patent literature for this year, I'll bet you will find at least 20 brand new patents for something magnetic alloys and iron. Now, we've been using magnetic iron for well over a century. You would think everything that could possibly be invented had been invented, but no. And one of the reasons is, because the problem is so serious, because there are so many cycles that go on in the world, even the tiniest improvement in the hysteresis loop of a uh, iron alloy that's going into a transformer core or something of the sort has real consequences, economic consequences for energy production. And that's why there are always big efforts trying to get just a little bit more improvement in those irons. Um, there are a number of things we would like to have. Magnetic is isotropy is a big issue. One of the big pushes to invent metallic glasses was the transformer issue. Because if I have a metal that is completely amorphous, it's homogeneous, therefore its hysteresis loss can be made a little lower. But unfortunately, rather high expense. Defect-free microstructures, large grain size. A metallic glass essentially has a grain size as large as you want. Very large grain, nice silicon is, is classic transformer steel. There are also many applications in which, um, see, if you, if you change the magnetic field, just, just go read Maxwell's equations, dBdt gives you a current. So if you start flipping the magnetic field, you start inducing currents. Well, these currents are costing you energy because of dual heating. So in many devices, particularly high-frequency microelectronic devices, there's a huge push to get things that are simultaneously ferromagnets, soft ferromagnets, and insulators. The best of these are the ferrite, like lithium ferrite insulators or oxides. They are ferromagnetic, but they have usable ferromagnetic moments, and you can flip them all you want, and you're not going to induce much of the real current. So that's a big issue. Piezomagnetism. I should have mentioned piezoelectricity, which is the same thing as electric field. I didn't. Uh, there's always um, a need to transform um, mechanical signals into electromagnetic signals and vice versa. The classic example is in recording. You say something. What you say appears in the air as a pressure wave. You can put that pressure wave onto a membrane, but now you've got to transfer it into an electronic signal that can be stored or carried to somewhere else. Similarly, you want to play back your recording. You've got to take this electronic signal, put it into some device that will convert it into a, magnet, into a, a, a mechanical signal that will move a membrane that will recreate the sound that you, you originally had. The devices that do that, ferroelectrics are particularly piezo, uh, piezomagnetic material. In a piezomagnetic material, you simply use the fact that if you put a magnetic field on a suitable material, its dimension will change, make it smaller or larger. But as the magnetic moments in it align, they will change the dimension of the unit cell, and therefore you get a mechanical change due to the magnetic field. It's usually rather small. The, uh, this is times 10 to the 6, so this is um, um, 30 millionths uh, change in length, fractional change in length. In nickel, which has a negative uh, piezomagnetic moment, uh, nickel iron, what's so called invar, has a positive change in length. Iron itself goes positive for a while and then negative. Well, the nice thing about these piezomagnetic materials, and some of the fancy ones now, terbium, uh, terbium dysprosium iron, has a significantly larger piezomagnetic effect than I've shown on this plot. Uh, the nice thing about these piezomagnetic materials is that the response is absolutely predictable and almost instantaneous. So you can take a mechanical signal, transfer it into a magnetic signal, which you can then transfer into an electrical signal very precisely, very accurately. You can read it back again very precisely, very accurately. These are the things that are used in, in almost all high-quality speakers that are around that are piezomagnetic materials, and in many other applications as well. And that's basically what happens. You just use the fact that as you align these magnetic moments, and you can align them almost instantaneously because they're associated with the electrons. You don't have to move electrons even to do it. You just flip the, the, the spin on the electron. So the response time is very, very fast and very clean. And these are the devices that we use to, in many cases, to, to transform up electrical signals into mechanical signals and vice versa. The problem with the piezomagnetics is that the effect is very small. So you don't get much of a mechanical response from your magnetic signal. Uh, when you need a bigger response, you tend to use sort of piezoelectric materials, which use the ferroelectric effect to do kind of the same thing. They can have much bigger strength, but they're also much slower in response. So these are, these are used in, in hyperspatial apparatus. Okay. That's all I need to say about ferromagnetism. Let me flip over now to superconductivity, which is a fascinating subject. It's always been kind of a, a grand mystery. So superconductivity over the years has more kind of funny stories associated with it than almost anything else. I worked on superconductivity for the fusion program back until the uh, late 80s. The reason I got out of it was very simple. In 1987, there was this headline discovery of oxide superconductors that suddenly moved the critical field, the, the critical temperature, temperature which you observe superconductivity, from down around helium temperature to all the way up around, uh, around nitrogen temperature. That generated probably the biggest single bit of hype in the history of science. There was a famous um, American Physical Society meeting they called the Woodstock of Physics, where guys just started presenting their results and went to 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, it created the scientific consensus overnight, universal among physicists, that this was the most important engineering breakthrough of the 20th century. I kid you not. You can go back and look at the papers at the Times and all the popular papers, and they will tell you that. There were a few of us who said, now, wait a minute, this is more hype than substance. But we were, we were the deniers. And, uh, uh, however, 13 years after the Woodstock of Physics, when we got to the turn of the millennium, and uh, they asked a whole bunch of materials, people, including me, to name the three biggest breakthroughs of the 20th century, almost no one put down oxide superconductivity. So why was there so much hype? And what happened? And why should everybody have known it sort of off the top? I'll tell you that. But let me go back to an even funnier story. The discovery of superconductivity was the Nobel Prize of a fellow named Conrad Onis, who was a professor of physics in, um, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands back at the end of the 19th century. He was not an electrical guy. He was a refrigeration specialist. And what he was very, very good at was making the world's best refrigerators. 
So he made this fabulous refrigerator that could go to very, very low temperature. Incidentally, if you go to the, the, the center of that refrigeration, moved to Berkeley uh, for a long time, if you go over to the chemistry building, you see the Joke Laboratory over there. Joke was a refrigeration guy. He for a long time held the world's record for lowest temperature. There a couple of chemists followed him. He got the Nobel Prize for it, and uh, others have followed him. And it's not true anymore, I don't think. But until very recently, our own chemistry department was the center for super low temperatures in the world. But Onus was one of the first guys who did this. So he invented this refrigerator that would go down to a fraction of a degree Kelvin. And he called in a graduate student, and he said, well, what can we do with this? I think I mentioned to you that if you take the a specific heat of the metal, and you take it down to very low temperatures, you get the result very low temperature, this linear temperature. No practical consequence to that, but it's phenomenal. So he said, aha, we can really observe that. So he told the guy to go measure it using his new refrigerator. So the guy went out and measured the conductivity of, I think it was copper, and came up with a beautiful curve. And Tommy Onus was so great, so he handed mercury. So he went out to measure mercury, and at about four degrees Kelvin, suddenly the resistivity disappeared. Couldn't measure it anymore. So he came back and he said, my God, your resistivity's all gone. And Onus said, you're an incompetent experimentalist. Try it again. So he tried it again, came back with the same result, and he fired you. So he brings in a new student. Gives the same experiment to the new student. New student comes back and says, I got the same result. At which point he says, maybe we're onto something here. So he publishes the, super, the discovery of superconductivity, picks up the Nobel Prize. Nobody even knows the name of the first student. <laughs> it happens. Um, so what is superconductivity? Well, let me go one step further. <laughs> you go to the, well, with the oxide, things are kind of fuzzy now. But the standard mechanism of superconductivity, which I'll tell you about just a little bit, is called the Cooper pair. It's two electrons get together. And I'll tell you in a minute why that's so important. But for the moment, just accept that that's what happens. Two electrons begin to interact with one another and travel as a unit. It's called the Cooper pair. Well, Cooper was a fine guy. He wasn't the guy who first came up with the idea. The guy who first came up with the idea is a guy named Oog. Now, Oog had two problems. One is that Oog was a chemist. And chemists aren't supposed to say anything about superconductivity. They're supposed to be physicists. So physicists not only paid any, didn't pay much attention to him, but um, there's a kind of a derogatory limerick about him that I used to head the chapter on superconductivity, if you happen to know it. Uh, the second problem was his name was Oog. Now, I've told you before, <laughs> if your name is Oog and you want some physics phenomenon to be named after you, change it to Smith, Jones, anything. Because nobody's going to talk about Oog pairs. Cooper pairs they'll talk about. Lee pairs they'll talk about. Oog pairs never make it. So Oog didn't do it. Okay, without, without introduction, what is superconductivity? Superconductivity is the complete loss of electrical resistance. I mean, it flat goes to zero. Now, why does that happen? Well, you might say, well, gosh, you know, copper is a really good conductor, so maybe if we got really, really pure copper and got it down to a low temperature, it would, resistance would go to zero. Well, strictly speaking, it would, but only in the limit of zero temperature, and then only if you didn't try to carry any current. So that particular kind of zero resistance wouldn't be any good to you. Superconductors can carry current. They are not just good conductors. They are a whole different ball of wax. Um, the story in superconductivity is basically this. Electrons are fermions. Fermions obey the Pauli exclusion principle. That means an electron cannot be where another electron is. That means we look at all the electrons and all their energy levels. To get any of them to move in a material, you've got to excite it to an empty level slightly above the Fermi level so that it's got states it can move into. But as soon as it runs into anything at all, its energy's gonna drop back down, it wants to have lower energy. As soon as you give it a chance at lower energy, it will. Therefore, there's always resistance. These things don't wanna move. There's another kind of particle, and those particles are bosons. Bosons are the other quantum mechanical solution, and they have no exclusion principle. You can put as many bosons as you want in the same state. In solid state physics, electrons are fermions, phonons are bosons. Nothing wrong with exciting a vibrational level as many uh, excitations as you wanna have. It's a boson, doesn't matter. So if we want to conduct electricity, we've gotta figure out a way to make our carriers bosons. Now, it turns out that uh, whether a particle is an electron or boson, goes back for fundamental reasons in quantum mechanics to its spin. If the particle has spin one half or any, um, any uh, energy plus one half, it will necessarily be a fermion. If it has spin zero or one or two or any whole energy, it will be a boson. Phonons have spin zero, so they're bosons. That says that if I can take two electrons and get them to function together so that their spins add, they will have the net particle will have spin zero or one and therefore will be a boson. Now, bosons will automatically sink to the lowest energy level. doesn't matter how many are there. So if you have a bunch of these electron pairs running along, they're all bosons, and one of them runs into something that's excited, it'll promptly drop back to the lowest energy state and keep going. So you can literally have zero resistance so long as you've got bosons instead of fermions in your conduction. Characteristics of superconductivity, well, zero resistance, Meissner effect. I always kind of explain this. Uh, you put a superconductor in a magnetic field, it expels the field. That's just telling you, it's another way of saying it has zero resistance because I, I introduce a dielectric current, it can become as big as it, diamagnetic current, it can become as big as it needs to be to kick that out. Cooper pairs, how do we get the electrons to be pairs? Well, this was Cooper's theory, the Landau how similar theory, probably should be the Cooper-Landau theory, probably should be the Oog theory, actually. <laughs> Cooper and Landau were the physicists who came up with, a, in fact, a much more sophisticated explanation. Oog really just pointed out that if they acted as a pair, they'd be a boson. Uh, but how can that happen? Because the electrons repel one another. What Cooper and Landau also figured out is that you can have an indirect coupling. They talk about coupling by means of a lattice vibration. What they're really talking about, well, let me take it back. What they're really talking about is a solution to certain equations in quantum mechanics that do not have a direct physical variation. So if you get out of here and go decide you're to study solid state physics and learn about superconductivity, you're going to learn the solution to these equations. You're going to say, I'm grossly oversimplifying everything. I am. But there is a visualization that you can use that kind of explains how Cooper pairs happen. And it's the following. Suppose I have an electron over here in the material. The electron is a negative charge. If this is an excess electron here in the material, because it's an electric charge, it will kind of polarize the atoms around it, these ion cores. So there's a slight polarization or distortion of the lattice because the electron is sitting there. Now let's suppose there's another electron over here. It will do the same thing. It will polarize the cores in its vicinity. And that says that these two electrons are both traveling not just as electrons, but as electrons plus lattice distortions. The lattice distortion is because the thing, the, the material is vibrating, even zero Kelvin has got a zero point vibration. The lattice distortion is kind of pulsating like that. So let's take these electrons with their lattice distortions and let's let them see one another within what's called the correlation line so that these pulsations kind of get in phase. Then we can actually have a binding interaction. We say between the two paired electrons, but it's not really the electrons that have the binding interaction. It's the complex of the electrons and the polarized uh, ion cores around it. Kind of a subtle effect. It certainly is a very strong interaction. But we go down to low enough temperature and that interaction can become big enough that these things remain associated. As long as they move as a correlated pair, you'll see physicists talk about two electrons and a phonon. Well, the phonon they're talking about is just a simple
you're looking for things that have this kind of behavior. And ironically, the things that are good metals, like um, uh, copper and gold and silver and such things, are not good superconductors at all. To get something that has this kind of behavior, you need a lattice that's preferably almost unstable, so that a slight perturbation will cause big excursions of the neighboring atoms. You need kind of the opposite of what you do to make a good conductor. And that's why the best elemental superconductors are things like niobium and such things. And the best superconductors of all are really trashy materials. Uh, two minutes, I'll take this further. Here are the superconductors in the periodic table. Transition metals can make good superconductors, they're lousy conductors. Some things over here are not bad superconductors. Ferromagnets cannot be superconductors. Well, there's a way to do it in really modern stuff. It's simple terms, they cannot be superconductors, because you can't have a Meissner effect in, in, in a ferromagnet. It's got a permanent magnetic field, you can't push it out. Uh, not only, um, okay, superconductors are characterized by three things that govern their engineering properties. Superconductivity was, was discovered in the late 19th century. The first applications of superconductivity made any engineering sense at all. It didn't come along until the 1960s, really. And um, we're constantly getting new applications of superconductors. People are more and more clever about them. But there's a reason for that, and here it is. Uh, superconductivity requires three things. First of all, the temperature must be below some low number, the critical temperature TC. Unless we're below TC, you can't keep these two pairs together because they're binding so weak, you lose superconductivity. However, remember that um, uh, electrons are also affected by magnetic fields. So magnetic fields will tend to drive these pairs apart as well. So you're not going to have to be below TC, you have to be below a critical magnetic field HC. Furthermore, if you start actually conducting a current of these pairs, then you get a number of further problems that uh, particularly having to do with superconducting vortices, I'll tell you about next time, that have the consequence that your current cannot be above some value JC. So superconductivity is, is confined to a uh, small region around a triple origin. Temperature below TC, magnetic field below HC, current below JC. Now, if you want to do an application of superconductivity, and I'll finish today with this sentence. For example, suppose you want to use a superconductor to make a magnet, which is an important application of popular superconductors. You want to wind it. You want to wind it into a solenoid. Well, the magnetic field that you can generate has to be below HC or your point's a superconductor. To generate the magnetic field, you've got to push current through the winding. So the current you need has got to be below JC or your point's a superconductor. And of course, the temperature is below TC. In terms of practical applications, while physicists tend to concentrate on TC, in many ways, that's the least important property of the superconductor. It's an on-off switch. You've got to be below TC. But once you are, for engineering applications, what matters is what is HC and what is JC. And for all the early superconductors, for reasons we'll talk about briefly next time, the critical current, critical field, and the critical current were unusably low. And that situation persisted until the discovery of what's called the type 2 superconductors back in the 1960s, at which point we finally started getting engineering applications of superconductors. Okay, that's it for today, and we'll pick it up on questions.